We're going to be talking today about what we can understand about one culture by exploring the way it depicts and describes another. And in this case, by looking at how a 19th century Russian official represented the cultures and peoples of Central Asia. I'm going to be focusing on a diplomatic document, the Memorandum to the Great Powers, which was written by Alexander Gorchakov in 1864. Um, Gorchakov wrote this document after the Russian conquest of Shim Kent in Central Asia, and in a period in which the Russian Empire was expanding its presence into Central Asia through military conquest. Uh, the memorandum was meant to explain Russian goals in the region. It was to be a statement of the Empire's intent in the area and to justify its military activities. The document unfolded in a series of very stark contrasts. Uh, Russia was consistently portrayed as a representation of, or a representative of civilization, order, and reason. The very nomadic peoples and states of Central Asia were, in contrast, defined as savage, unruly, wild, primitive, etc. There were very few distinctions drawn among them in the document. They were broadly defined as Asiatics. Um, the memorandum described the Russian conquest in the region as a civilizing mission. It was an attempt to bring civilization and pro progress to a region that lacked it and to peoples that were at best half primitive or half savage, if we were going to use the terminology of the document. Gorchakov asserted that the Russian conquest in the region was a unwelcome necessity, and he described the Russian people as reluctant colonizers. They didn't want to encroach on the region or to extend the borders of the empire into civilization. They were forced to, owing to the unstable tribes, um, the unruly confederations, and the failed states that existed alongside its borders. Russia, according to Gorchakov, um, had to pacify these regions so that the chaos and disorder there did not undermine or disrupt the integrity of the empire. There is very little to be gained in terms of acquiring historical facts from looking at this document. Uh, the memorandum offers a very simplistic portrayal of the complex mosaic of Central Asian traditions in the 19th century. There are very few references to specific peoples or to polities. The complexities of the region um, are absorbed in definitions of a savage and amorphous Asia with Gorchakov speaking unproblematically of things like the Asiatic mind and temperament. Everything in Central Asia is sort of lumped together and labeled primitive, um, while the Russian Empire at that time, a sprawling agglomeration of ill-defined lands and peoples, was defined as the very embodiment of civilization. The memorandum offers very little in the way of reliable information on the actual lives and realities of Central Asian peoples in this period. Um, its evocations of savagery and backwardness do little justice to the intricate cultures that had formed in this region. The memorandum is useful, however, in understanding how the Russian Empire understood and defined itself through contrast with Central Asia. It affords valuable insights into the anxieties and ideas that informed the Russian imagination of this region. And it is a particularly striking example of the us and them contrast that defined this imagination. And us and them contrast is a process whereby we define ourselves through negative contrast with others. It involves defining another group or people negatively as being the opposite the complete reverse image of what we consider ourselves to be. And in this case, it involved an empire that imagined itself to be the embodiment of civilization. And that created a portrait of Central Asia that sharpened this image. Central Asia was savage while the empire was culture. It was 
primitive in comparison to Russia's civilization. The more backward Russia portrayed the region, the more developed it appeared in contrast. These kinds of contrasts and the definitions they create are quite often arbitrary. They are not necessarily born out of any contact with reality. They are concepts that don't necessarily bear a relationship to the things of the world. They often arise out of the human need to transform what is complex and unknown to more simplistic and familiar categories. Such ideas, however, can acquire weight and density over time and become internalized as they are reiterated. By the time Gorchakov wrote his memorandum, similar ideas about Central Asia had been in circulation in Russia for more than a century and had been repeated and reiterated in varying forms in geographies, government papers, histories, and travel documents. Uh, the memorandum in this sense summarizes a consistent and enduring representation of Central Asia and the Russian imagination or a cluster of representations focusing on its supposed primitiveness and backwardness. Uh, many of these ideas had begun to collect, coalesce in the era of Peter the Great, um, a period in time in which Russia began to define itself as a distinctly European and Western civilization. This decision involved a long, complex effort to untie Russia's identity from Asia. And if you remember the Vedaschagan paintings that I discussed last time, and if you've had a time to take a look at them, you can see some of the defining stereotypes of these representations. A Central Asia that was considered exotic and strange, moribund or stuck in time, and that had once been an ancient civilization, but was now in ruins. A document like this then tells us less about Central Asia at this particular time and place, and more about a very dense, knitted together body of representations in the Russian Empire. Uh, representations that reinforced imperial attitudes and that reduced teeming complexity into something far more simple. Korchako, for example, would argue that he was capable of delimiting the borders between Russian civilization and the more primitive cultures of Central Asia, as if it were possible for anyone to delimit the ethnic complexities of Central Asia's diversity with geographic precision at this or any historical moment. What we have then in the memorandum is a sort of archive of the ideas that accumulated in the Russian imagination. Um, it is an artifact in the Russian Empire's understanding of Central Asia. It affords us insights into a body of ideas or to a cluster of representations that hardened and became dense in the Russian imagination of Central Asia in this era.